All right, y'all thought that I might be fibbing. This is proof right now. The Letterman Podcast. We have one sponsor, one sponsor only, but it is Rupert G and the Hello Deli. Thank you very much for sponsoring our show, Rupert. It's my honor, Mike. La 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 Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. As always, my name is Mike Chisholm. I'm excited to be here and do this. I swear to God, I keep telling y'all I'm excited because the conversations that I have with these people is a dream come true. And I mean, who wouldn't be excited by a dream come true? And they, the dreams are taking different dimensions. The squares are becoming cubes. Uh, it's very cool because now we're getting to a point where some of our guests who came on a first time uh, we've developed relationships and, and even seen each other, uh, in person and, and, and whatnot. And, 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 uh, you know, uh, in some cases our wives have gotten together and now they're coming back on the show as friends with a completely different, um, mindset, the origin story as it's, uh, as, uh, as we call it, uh, in comic book fandom has been told. And now it's just, let's shoot the bull a little bit and talk. Uh, about David Letterman, comedy, all the things that surround it, the careers of some of these people, where they went, what they did, what they learned. I love that. Today is one of those episodes. Um, Steve Weiner was there. He's an OG, late night writer. He was there on day one. Um, and uh, by the way, he's been on the show before. That episode, uh, lots of people really, really liked it. Um, and, and, and there were questions that came out of that episode. Uh, those questions have been answered. Steve and I go into that. You can watch the episode to, to understand that, um, including uh, why the thumbnail uh, on his uh, previous episode was Dick Van Dyke and where that picture was taken, even though we didn't talk about Dick Van Dyke, uh, which was our little kind of joke. But we talk about it here in this episode, among many other things, including uh, night one of uh, late night one, Bill Murray uh, and, and the legend of Bill Murray getting the entire writing staff drunk in preparation to see what they were going to do. Steve tells that story, recollects it. Uh, we've got a really cool story. The, the, one of the rarest Letterman crew jackets uh, was discussed in this episode. Uh, you'll have a lot of fun uh, hearing that story if you like um, arcane uh, information that uh, really doesn't have any value whatsoever, but you just enjoy hearing things about what went on behind the scenes at late night back in the day. We talk about um, bigger things as well. I just... I. I love Steve Weiner. Uh, he is fantastic. Uh, the wall of books behind him, by the way, in both the first episode and this episode, same wall of books. However, uh, not telling too many tales out of school. Um, he had options. There are other walls of books. He might be one of the most well-read people I've ever met. Um, and I just, he's a, he's a plethora of wisdom and information. I appreciate him so much. And he's a friend. He and, he and, he and Lori are, are friends of Candy and I, and, and, uh, and it's as a result of the Letterman podcast, which is uh, mind blowing to me. Uh, I'm grateful beyond measure to be able to do this. I hope you're having fun. Uh, it's a lot of fun listening to and watching the results. This is our first official episode, uh, that we put up in the new studio or the evolving studio. We got stuff more to come. We say more to come a lot on this thing. I wonder where we got that from. Anyway, I am very appreciative to, um, you know, I, I, Steve, it's, it's good that I'm shooting this intro without Steve being here. I actually uh, shot another intro and then um, I'm doing it again after the conversation because I just, uh, he is such a great guy and I just appreciate him so much. Um, we talk about Meryl Marco in this episode. Anytime we contribute Meryl Marco with anybody, um, not, uh, not contribute anytime we can tribute Meryl on this show. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a good day's work as far as I'm concerned. And, um, just the insights that Steve has, um, you know, he's clearly um, a master of his craft and has uh, used his craft in a variety of ways. We're going to talk about it right now. Uh, this episode is, as always, brought to you in part by the Hello Deli. Go to hello-deli.com. If you want any Late Show with David Letterman merchandise or Rupert G merchandise, if you're in the New York area, please go to the Hello Deli. Uh, get a soup, get a sandwich, uh, get your picture taken with Rupert and May. Uh, just enjoy uh, the experience while we have it. And uh, I'm just, yeah. Thank you for uh, being on this journey. Please like, please share, please subscribe. Let's get us to that next level. So, I'll tell you this, 
The moment we get to that next level, whatever that level is, I'll never ask again. I'll never ask again. I'll be advertising things like contests and all that kind of crap. So uh, thank you very much for supporting the show the, the way that you have. Um, I'm going to do my very, very best to keep the episodes fresh and fun, uh, insightful, and maybe even, uh, dare I say it, entertaining. So here we go. Now, uh, please, the Letterman Podcast presents episode number, what is this, number 38 maybe? Uh, something like that. We've got a couple in the can too. So uh, episode 38, I believe, is what this is, or maybe 39. Who's counting? Steve Weiner returns to the Letterman Podcast. Enjoy. <laughs> Embarrass me. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to, just so you know, in the intro, I, I edify the hell out of you. So, uh, okay. yeah, no, you like the set? Yeah, this is new, huh? Yeah, it's coming. It's coming along. We're uh, So this what? bridge is from Late yeah. Show. It's actually yeah. from Late Show. Is it really? Um, How did you get it? Um, So on May 21st, 2020, um, many of the staff and enthusiasts of Dave uh, lovingly referred to that day as D-Day, Dumpster Day, uh, mm -hmm. when the CBS crew showed up and mercilessly um, just started tearing apart this legendary set and throwing it in dumpsters. And um, some of the crew uh, went and rescued some of these things, and 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 some friends of mine and I are are currently trying to figure out where some of the big bridges and things like that are. Mm -hmm. This one here was rescued that day. And it's one that can fit in a, uh, you know, the, the studio was so big in the Ed Sullivan theater that the bridges right. were huge. This one here could actually fit in a normal home studio. So very happy to have that. That's very nice. I have one request for you. Yes, sir. One request. Can you please, for the love of God, take the picture of Sarah Palin off the back wall while I'm talking. To you? <laughs> I don't ask much. I think that, if I have to look at that woman for this next hour, this is going to be a very, very different conversation than it would normally be. I it mean, I begins. think that's a, I this just think it it's only fair. I mean, really, if I had a picture of Hitler over my shoulder, wouldn't it change the tenor of things? Please, no, just put oh. it down, put it away, put it down, put it away. If you won't actually torch it in my presence, at the least you can do is keep it the hell off the set. Thank you. <laughs> Can you believe I got her to endorse the Letterman podcast? Oh, I can um, actually believe it. I can believe it. <laughs> That's one of the easier things that anyone's ever asked me to believe. Yes, I believe it. She couldn't even win her election in Alaska. So, yeah, she's down to to, to uh, promoting podcasts now. Yeah, so. but she tried to get Dave fired. I mean. <laughs> well. <laughs> is that a, is that a, and that's a reason to keep her on the wall there like that? I mean, well, really. I, that's why uh, that's why I thought when the opportunity arose in front of me, I thought it was the universe giving me an opportunity for comedy. That's for darn sure. Uh, well, there's comedy, I guess, and there's comedy. There's a different <laughs> kinds of. Comedy. <laughs> well, you know, I think back. You know, it's so funny. I remember when. Um, and I'm not a political guy. I don't want to get into, you know, the, right. I don't want to, I don't want to divide people and all that kind of stuff, but it's funny about the things that we used to make fun of um, with politicians, like, like famously uh, Johnny Carson never got a chance to make fun of Bill Clinton. Uh, right. You know, he, he left right as, as that began. Dave never got a chance to uh, be doing what he did when Donald Trump was, was president, you know, it was, right. but Dave did have George W. Bush. And I, I mean, they had those mm -hmm. legendary segment, great moments in presidential speeches. And it was just George, just being George. And that's all mm -hmm. they did was put a couple little clever edits around it and just let him be him. Boy, is it a different time now when it comes to. <laughs> You know, instead of George yeah. Bush, you know, tripping or falling into a door or trying to open a door and it not opening, you know, and th this is the recipe for comedy, uh, right. making poking fun at our leaders. It's a different animal now, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And I mean, I, I, I think there should have been a little more of that kind of comedy, even when when George Bush was was president. But, you know, I, it, everybody to their own taste. And, I, you know, you want to keep the audience large, I guess. I mean, Colbert's <laughs> done very well, you know, with with the, the people who feel the way he does. And that's been a nice enough, large enough audience to keep him rolling. So, and, and I not can't just rolling number it. one, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is, is that crazy considering the competition? I don't know. It seems just seems logical to me. I mean, I, I don't. Have, I haven't really seen Kimmel at all, so I don't want to. I don't want to say anything about him. I can do without Jimmy Fallon generally. <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a bit of a game show thing. Hey, you know, actually, I want to talk about Fallon a little bit here. I have mm -hmm. this sometimes. Um, 
uh, in the in, in the in the in the wrestling business, uh, people talk about fantasy booking. I would put this right. person or the boxing business or whatever. I would love dream matchups. Right. Um, I do that with. Uh, this is just uh, gives you a little bit of insight as to the 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 the, the freak that I am. I do talk show uh, fantasy booking. I always think mm-hmm. about ideas that I would love to see in these shows. There's there's a Fallon idea that I have. We recently just had Joe Grossman on um phenomenal guy i love him so much he was a writer for late show for a long time now he's writing for fallon and oh. it was funny after we after we uh after we converse i sent him an email um going hey wait a second do i have like do i have a pitch line for the tonight show right now could i actually every once in a while send you <laughs> ideas uh to pitch because i've always had this piece of fantasy booking and it has to do with actually something that i believe started while you were at late night were you there when elevator races started yeah i think yeah i was i think so yeah i think i didn't know they did them more often i guess i do remember elevator races yeah you remember the the genesis probably is what you remember well i remember i guess the first one i didn't know there was there was actually more than one um my my idea is this um and this is something i want to talk to you about steve uh, for sure as, as well this is going to segue into um how, how how you really at the end of the day didn't watch a ton of dave especially during the late night years after you left uh and and i and i and i like that because you've got a fresh perspective in many many ways but my idea anyway here's my fantasy Ooh. talk show booking it's that um Later on in, in, in the late show or early in the late show run, Dave would periodically call up Johnny Carson for various reasons. This is after mm-hmm. Johnny retired. And one of the things that he called Johnny for was he asked him if they could use Stump the Band moving forward in uh in, in late show as that moved forward. And it was a neat conversation. It was a you know, the young the young lion talking to the old legend. Um, you know, and and it was it was a neat thing. And then we got to see that move on my idea uh was the idea that jimmy fallon would call up david letterman and say hey um you know can we use elevator races and then have him and seth do some sort of comedy piece that would go from one show to the other and uh it would capture a little bit of that magic that you guys had at 30 rock that was one of the things that i think was was so special about um your shows at 30 rock was that you would you would involve the rest of the broadcast building and the family that was in there. I thought that was a very inventive thing. Was that something? So anyways, that's my little piece of uh, fantasy talk show booking, but was that something that was there from the get go that you guys were going to kind of cause trouble to the studios around you and all that? I, I don't think anybody made a conscious choice. I think it's something that just evolved. I can't even remember whose idea elevator was, was probably Merrill's, but I'm not, I, I genuinely don't know. So if anybody does, know, I, and it was somebody else. I apologize. Uh, no, I don't think it was specifically that. I think it was just trying to mess with the format. When you start mess, I mean, the first the, the first episode has a behind, starts with that behind the scenes tour, right? So we were showing, we were showing behind what was going on, and that I think was definitely a Merrill idea. I think we all contributed jokes to it, but that, but I think that was Marilyn Marilyn Dave's idea. Um, and so I think it was right from the beginning was the idea with messing with, with the, the idea of the show. I think they did some of that on the morning show too. Uh, yeah. So I, I think you know it was just. You know, a lot of this comes from Steve Allen and, you know, Steve Allen was all over that kind of thing. You know, the, the uh, doing people on, putting camera out on the street and, you know, making fun of people on the street or doing stuff about in the in the studio, going out into the into the with the audience and doing stuff like that. Uh, in fact, a number of his bits, it's interesting you said that they asked permission you stump the band, stump the band. I think it was a Carson invention, but a lot of Carson sketches were actually I can politely say lifted from Steve Allen. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean the the, uh, the 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 soap opera bit where he pans around the audience and does the I think they call it Edge of Wetness on the Carson show. That came from there. The tea time movie thing was 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 oh, was, was was definitely a Steve Allen bit. Uh, the, there are others too. I know Jonathan. He stole Aunt, Aunt Blabby was an outright steal from Maud Frickett from Jonathan Frickett from Jonathan Winters. So Carson was was lifted a lot of material. So it's interesting. That other people were a little more polite than he he may have been when when doing his show. To, well, there's, to... a, there's, a, there's a couple things with that. Now, number one, Johnny is uh, uh, carrying the mantle of the Tonight Show, so you wonder at that point there is it okay? Is this a franchise? Uh, you know, legacy piece that we could just continue on and evolve and change things around, or is it? Uh, you know, and this is I want to talk to you about the comedy I... writer mentality because this well, is something I'm. Also... I... I can tell you something specific to that because I actually asked Steve Allen that very question when he was on the show. 
So because he was he we, we wrote a sketch for him that got unfortunately ran too long, got cut in half. So it doesn't make any sense on the air. Right. But uh, but but the bit the original idea was funny. And, and, you know, we got to spend the better part of the afternoon with Steve Allen and we're both huge Steve Allen fans. So I asked him, I said, look, I started listing all these things. And I, there were a couple of others I, I didn't mention to you, but there were a bunch that they took from him. Yeah. And and I, he said, um, you know, that that uh, first thing he was throwing people, I, I said, does it tick you off? And he said, well, you know, Johnny's a very different comedian. He's got his own style and he's got his own thing. But yeah, it does tick me off. So that that's the answer. Wow. Uh, he, he was not he was not happy about that. Uh, he, he said he's, he's absolutely perfectly fine with David Letterman doing bits of his because he said Dave always credits him. So he said, he you know, he really likes Dave. He really right. liked David. He really admired David. And he said he had no problem when, you know, when when Dave did a, something that he, he might have done before because he always mentioned it, uh, you know, you know. That I'll tell you this. Um, one of my favorite Don Giller compilations, and I, it's it's literally comfort food for me. Like if I'm mm-hmm. if I'm homesick on the couch or something, and I want to put some comfort food on, I put on his compilation of Dave interviewing talk show hosts over the years mm-hmm. because it's like seven parts, and each part's like an hour right. and a bit. Like it's expansive, mm-hmm. um, and 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 I would say a complete archive. Um, but I love the beginning. For a couple of reasons, whenever he had guys like Alan or Parr or some of these other uh, folks, Merv, for that matter, mm-hmm. uh, some of these people on um, and Dave was such a freshman interviewer, you know, and, and I mean, we've talked at, at length about on this show about uh, Dave's evolution as an interviewer from 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 literally freshman all the way up to, you know, Ph.D. We watched it in front of us over the three decades. But the reverence. This kid would like you would see literally see Dave getting nervous um, right. in front of these people. The the you know you t- you talk about the respect, the reverence he had mm-hmm. for these people uh, yeah. who came before him. Of course, Johnny Carson being you know uh, sure. the top of the heat, but but every single other one, um, you know that was that was evident. Even though right. you guys were changing the format, the respect you guys all seem to have, you guys and gals all seem to have for the ones who came before uh, seems to be paramount. Yeah, well, I think, I think you know, again, we weren't saying we're thinking of doing something in this style or that style. We we're just trying to get the stuff in. But yeah. certainly, you know, I mean, I, I think there was that, always that Steve Allen connection in what we were doing too. This has a sense of that kind of thing. But, you know, we then we moved off into our own direction. Yeah. But uh, it's in, I think part of the reverence is I always suspect it was certainly at that time when, as you said, he was just a novice interviewer. Uh, is how, how you know what Jack Parr was most com- was I mean he always looked nervous that was part of his bit but he was still very comfortable do you know having the conversation probably more than Dave was at that time so I think he aspired to that probably too and I think he eventually yeah. got there uh, so certainly that you know and he also I think I think and I, you know I'm just playing the mind reader which is which and he, you probably are good as I am in this case but I think Dave had a real reference reference for people that are just broadcasters what we used to call classic broadcasters so it didn't even have to be the talks the people who did what he did yeah you know he also liked tom snyder very much you know he, he liked keith oberman he liked people who had that kind of comfort with the you know with the camera who can really do that kind of thing and i think those are the people he, he really respected those you know and certain comedians but i think actors not as much on some level i always got that feeling he didn't have that kind of connection to actors when he was interviewing he could do it and enjoy it but i, I don't know I, I wondered if you ever asked him, do you have a favorite actor? I'm not sure he would have. I wonder what his answer would have been or if he would have had one. I don't think I don't know if anybody ever did that. But when you start talking about people in television, he had a long list. Uh, so, without a doubt. Um, I, I love that we m- kind of moved over here because there was leftovers from the previous time that you mm-hmm. were on this show. And, and this is the first time that we've done this since. Uh, uh, you know, since becoming friendly, since since Candy and I came over and had a, had a beautiful, beautiful brunch. Um, you know, it, it's great. I, I'm feeling this kinship with you, and it's 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 a lovely, lovely thing. But then there's always that. Okay, but what happens when the wives get together? And you and I lucked out in the sense that our wives connected uh, beautifully, and it's like, all right, right on. Steve and I can be friends now. We we can actually can have that <laughs> that level. Um, well, we, I don't think of that many of the wives of my friends who are who were like miserable about the prospect. I mean. <laughs> You know. Well, I mean, how could anybody, candy. by the way, not be friends with your wife? Lori is unbelievable. What a what a what a what an amazing woman. Well, she's she listening is. at the door, so uh, if she doesn't faint altogether, 
I would expect nothing less and 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 hope for nothing less. Uh, we the regard we have for both of you is so high. One Thank of you. the things that I wanted to talk about uh, the last Ooh. time we talked about it at breakfast a little bit, and you told me some some beautiful stories. I this is the, the the generational part of this that you and I are just talking about. These Reverend Steve Allen, these giants who were right. broadcasters but comedic broadcasters right mm -hmm. from the from the get go. And I think that uh, many times um, when I when I say what I'm about to say, people kind of look at me funny, but at the end of the day there were broadcasters who had a comedic slant right from the invention of television uh, i mean you know it's not a new thing but gen x is a little bit different i love talking about this generational stuff with you uh and i've got some questions today about that uh, but but i this is the statement i've used before um and you have a little bit of a, a specific insight to this david letterman is my walter cronkite and and so um you know he just he just is the the, the guy that i kind of looked to and trusted you know, um, Walter Cronkite was one of those trusted newsmen, mm -hmm. but, but for Gen X, we had this, this is where I think that the, that the, um, maybe the apathy kind of started, you know, the kids of the baby boomers who, who, mm -hmm. who, who did so much to change so many things. And, and the next generation is just going to be apathetic about the previous one. That's just, we're seeing it now with millennials, how they view us. Sure. Um, but now Walter Cronkite, David now Lennon is my Walter like. Cronkite. Uh -huh. You lived across the street from the guy. <laughs> I did. We did for many years. For, for uh, decades, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, that, that's many years. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> actually, I actually met him a couple of times because my father knew him. Through, my father was uh, worked. I mean, he was a write, playwright and writer, but he also was uh, for many years a deputy executive director of the Writers Guild, which he'd helped to found. And he used to ask, you know, Walter to do the the the, the uh, annual awards dinners. So he knew him a little bit. And he was a uh, Cronkite was just a really, really nice man. I mean, he was exa exactly who you would sort of hope he would be. I can't say I knew, knew him or anything, but I met him a number of times. And he couldn't have been nicer each time that I met him. So it was nice to have, you know, somebody who is like, who really was like that. He, he was the guy. He seemed to be the guy you saw on television. Oh, I love that. I, lo I that, yeah, uh, that's that's such a beautiful thing uh, to say that about somebody who has that, you know, the what you see is what you get mm -hmm. um, idea. And that's what you would hope. You know, uh, yeah. when I hear some of these stories about uh, somebody who who, who has a, a super high following or is in a really top position, and then you hear about their behavior behind the scenes. And I mean, right. boy, is that ever uh, a, a focal point of our culture these days? A reckoning is happening with 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 people who right. behave badly and 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 what can happen. But there's it's just it's there's a little bit of disappointment that comes in. It's kind of like hearing that your base, favorite baseball player is a dick, <laughs> you know, and 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 uh but aren't they um, all? Well, I don't know. I mean oh, I don't know. I don't uh, know. not I'm in not, my not experience. Okay. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. And whenever I hear a story about a baseball player, it's usually something unpleasant. So I'm just hoping that there's some nice ones out there too. Oh, heavens. There's a, uh, yes. Uh, the industry of sport has many inspirational uh, uplifting yeah, lessons yeah. as well, yeah. but th th it's the ones that aren't that I think, um, you know, people remember and they focus right. on. Walter's one of those guys where, uh, you know, you just, you hope what you see is what you get with him. The, that actually reminds me of one of my favorite lines in a movie that a movie that hardly anybody saw. And I'm not a sports person. I don't know, but I don't follow this stuff, but Ron Shelton, who you have, most people know from the, um, the famous Kevin Costner, the baseball picture. The natural. Um, thank you. No, no, yeah. no. That's oh, Field of Dreams. Business. Sorry, Field of Dreams. No, not that either. It's the, it's the he did a lot of Bull baseball Durham. Pictures. Yes, thank you. Ron Shelton wrote and directed. I was going to get it. Direct... The Kevin Costner baseball movies. I think. I think. I, I think know I there's so many of there. Uh, no, there was another one that Sam Raimi directed. That's called For the Love of the Game. There's just he just a lot did a lot oh, of baseball. Oh, for the love of the game. Oh my god. Right. Yeah. In any case, the, he did a, uh, Ron Shelton did a picture called Ty called Cobb about Ty Cobb, who was one of the most unpleasant people yeah. in the business, you know, ever. And there's a great line in that that I, that I remember many times in my business where somebody uh, that, um, well, I'm not going to remember anybody's name today, but uh, the, the actor who played the journalist who was also a comedian. Uh, if, if you're, if you're a bad memory, somebody will remember this. In any case, he's talking to Lolita Davidovich and, and, you know, at a bar after, you know, following Cobb around all the time. And she says, why do you put up with it? And he says, he, I think he's a genius. And she says, genius is overrated. And I've always mm -hmm. remembered that line. Uh, there, there, you know, in some cases, people get a, get a pass because they're really, really great at something. And I think now finally, I think that has been a tradition, not just in sports, in show business, in a lot of things.
Sure. And I, and I think maybe there's a there, there's a reckoning across the board for some of the people who are who are who might be good at something but are also you know assholes basically. And I I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it doesn't take away from what they did, but maybe that should not be an excuse. This is the conversation I wanted to get into, and I, I it's it's beautifully evolving right over that way. Um, I think you're right. I think that uh, we're seeing that and that theory tested. That we're seeing people who are actually right now at the time of this recording, we're seeing people who have this larger than life um, place, or at least they self perceived larger than life place, and they're testing what they can say i mean at the time of this recording the kanye stuff has just happened well right. the kanye how specific isn't it funny how <laughs> i could say that and if this was 10 years ago people would say oh yeah that kanye stuff and now right, <laughs> right. that kanye there's stuff. always some new stuff but there's always some new yeah, stuff this, but this, this current kanye stuff current elon right. musk stuff right. you've got these right. larger than life characters that are uh testing the boundaries of what can be said and cannot be said and are they stretching things and are they evolving free speech uh versus you know shouting fire in a crowded theater you know i i i just uh, it's a fascinating time yeah it's um, it's, 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 the, it's the art versus the artist the conundrum and yes. i think that you know there are people who who everybody's got a different line of what they can tolerate and and then still enjoy that performer it in my case for example a lot of the performer i mean someone like like Bill Cosby, who, yep. you know, I grew up, you know, a lot of people grew up in the eighties, they grew up in a sitcom, but I grew up on his standup, which was, I think he was one of the greatest standups who ever lived. Oh, Bill Cosby and, himself is one of the greatest comedy albums I've ever, yeah. I've ever encountered. And, yeah. But all, all, all of his comedy, you know, his albums from the sixties and, you know, I remember his standup, I, you know, I saw him, at, you know, in, several times live do standup. He's phenomenal. Yeah. I, 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 I knew, I mean, in the business, people knew he was not liked. I mean, when they knew he was a womanizer, they knew he was just not a pleasant person. I used to hear stories backstage about how, unple you know, just unpleasant he was as a person. Yep. I didn't hear that. No one heard the serial rapist story to the best of my knowledge. Right. And I find it now hard to go back and look. It's bizarre. I mean, I actually, it, it's still interesting because I watched, I don't know if you saw this documentary series, uh, We Need to Talk About Cosby, which was, which was done, which was really well done. And I haven't yet. Where, where, where is really that? Just, it's on Hulu, I think, but I, I, I believe. It's okay, uh, yeah. w, uh, w. Kamel Bell, I think, then, and, and it's it's really really good because uh, they really analyzed. First of all, they also d discussed over the period the episodes how important he was in each decade for different reasons. Important in the sixties for stand up. Important in the seventies because of the kids show stuff. Yep. In the eighties for the sitcom, all of that. So it, you have to discuss how important he was before you discuss what was going on at the same time, which is what he yes. does. And and I think that really put it puts it into the context. But at the same time. I don't think I could really watch it again, but they ran clips from some of the stand-up and I was laughing again. So it's like you, you know, you it's it's impossible not to because he was that good. Um, but there were people that, you know, I mean, Jerry Lewis, I was huge and still am a huge Jerry Lewis fan. Yeah. I had a really nice meeting with him backstage at Letterman. He couldn't have been nicer. But I know people personally who had horrible experiences with him. And there was an article about him in Vanity Fair more recently with telling some stories that, you know, I didn't know, but were not that surprising. Mm -hmm. I can't not I can't stop laughing at Jerry Lewis at this point in my life, but I would understand people who could not make that jump. OK, um, you know, th there's a lot of that. And, and it, it, it becomes it, and I keep saying to people because I, I have no certain amount about history of classic Hollywood and classic broadcasting as well as if 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 we start going backwards yes. in time. Yes. There's not going to be anybody left for you. So you're going to. You're going to, or maybe a handful, you know, Jack Benny, everybody was, was the nicest man in the world. There were a handful of people who were really, really nice. Yeah. But once you start going through the history of show business, not just comedy, but acting and Hollywood and whatever. And looking at it with today's glass, right. today's you're vantage not, you're, point. You're, yeah. You're, yeah. It's going to be hard to look at a lot of these people. Sure. So I don't, I don't fault people who is still would like to, who might still like a given performer that I may not be able to connect. To. Uh, but I, I, because I grew up with, all of these performers, most of whom were probably not very nice people. Um, I, I think I can, I make that detachment in my head to at least to varying degrees. But I guess once you get up to serial rapists, it's harder.
Well, okay. So yes, that's just it. Now, 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 I mean, we're talking about an extreme example right. from an extreme giant, like culture changing. Right. Like you think about right. uh, uh, somebody for, for an African-American, uh, I mean, to, to become, to get to the place that he did and what he did for, uh, you know, I remember uh, an episode of the Cosby show that I watched and, and, and as a kid, and this is to my to my memory, the first time I ever saw the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. And uh, and the, the, it was a very simple scene. It was the very end of an episode. Um, I don't know if it was around the time of when at that point, the holiday wasn't there, but it might've been Martin Luther King's birthday. I'm not sure why it aired when it aired, but basically an episode of the Cosby show happened. It was a typical episode. And then at the end they came out of the kitchen. I, I think it was Rudy who was sitting in front of the TV, just watching the, I have a dream speech. And I believe that's the first time I ever saw that speech huh. as a child. Um, on the Co the Cosby show yeah. and you look at what Bill Cosby did like you said and I'm just all I'm doing is accentuating your point Steve is is, is right. the idea of talking about the great stuff before we move into that so these are right. extreme examples but the men's mental wellness podcast that I host um, you know I don't think when we were Gen Xers uh, you know Nirvana listening flannel wearing coffee drinking uh, apathetic uh, you know generation I don't think that we had in our minds the idea that as we push the envelope in the specific ways that we did, the problem that we were going to have when we were in our 40s and 50s is that we were going to take uh, our lives, the memory of our lives at that time, where we were just stumbling along. We were just trying to figure things out. We were trying to just, you know, and then we would be judged on the actions or the the behaviors of the culture i was raised on porkies i mean mm -hmm. and in locker rooms that were very different than locker rooms now you know mm -hmm. and 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 i i don't think any of us could foresee um you know as we were thinking oh it's it's safe to be gay you know that the right. gen x that's the badge of honor that that, that we kind of wear um you know and, and it's safe to come out and all of that kind of stuff and we challenged a lot of things I don't think we could have predicted that this was going to be one of the problems that we had with the generation that followed. Um, and in comedy writing specifically, uh, you and I talked about this at breakfast. And and mm -hmm. I, again, in the intro, I edified, the, like I say, I edify the heck out of you. You are a professor. We talked about how Steve's doing, uh, uh, you know, a, a comedy writer's class mm -hmm. at NYU. You are you are a fucking professor, Steve. You you just are. Uh, you, you, you could be doing this. And I love the discussion we had about comedy writing um, right. in today's day and age, because I said the same thing that many of the cutting edge comics right now say who have no problem testing the boundaries. If it's funny, it's okay. And, and I said that at the table and we got into a really nice discussion about that because, you know, the idea of actually having responsibility, okay, it may be funny, but are you being responsible in saying these things? You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm seeing, I think I'm different from a lot of the people I know my age or who are in, in this business because the, the whole thing that, you know, I keep seeing, I see some people that I know, not a lot of them, fortunately, but the things, you know, you're this, well, woke, woke people, you can't be funny. And no one can be, there's no, nothing's funny anymore. Well, actually that's bull. Yeah. And it really infuriates me when I hear people who actually should know better talk about it, particularly people who are politically otherwise in, my, in would be in my camp. And I think that, that I hear that and it really annoys me because what they're really saying is they can't be funny anymore with the material that they did when they were starting out maybe 30 years ago or 40 years yep. ago or 20, or even 20 years ago. And the fact of the matter is comedy always changes. It always did. I'm sure if I went through the lead, if we, if you and I went through the Letterman archives together from 82, there's jokes we wouldn't do anymore. Absolutely. Okay? In the same token, that was 40 years ago, 40 years before the Letterman show was the middle of World War II. And they were doing jokes about Germans and Japanese people that we could wouldn't do in 1982. Yes. Things change. Yes. And I re really annoy. And also when they say nothing's funny, there's so much comedy out there right now that's funny. That it, I just it's like it, what are you talking about? And and then none of these people who the young people who are doing comedy now seem to have terrible trouble getting. I mean, some do because they particularly push the boundaries. That's their choice. Sure, that's a choice. That's a choice. But there are plenty of people who who can who can write really good and create or perform really good comedy that doesn't that that isn't necessarily racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever. There's a lot of topics that the world's write comedy about or perform comedy about. You don't have to do the same jokes you did before. And, you know, I've always said, I said, you know, if your old joke doesn't write, doesn't work, write a new one. That is literally the definition of the job. 
Okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. You know, and I know that there are people who say, well, that you're just, you're doing, you know, you can say this because you're not working the business anymore. Well, that, okay. If you want to say that, fine. But if I were working in the business, I would hope I would be writing, you know, anybody who writes for any particular project fits their what they do to that project <clears throat> you don't write the same for david letterman as you do writing for the disney channel you don't right. write the, you know and you, it's a different just because it's a different show it's a different job yep. so you you learn to adapt to what you're doing and ideally there's a point where what they're doing what you do that was well, something that's you meshes so yes. that i can look at something on a, on a show that i worked on and say yeah that represents something that that's of me but it fits into this context. Meryl said something to me once that I always remembered because it was a, a really nice thing, but she was, I think she was right. And I think it was her doing. She said, what she loved about the show is there was so about the writers in the show is there's so many different styles of comedy writing on the show, mm -hmm. but they all fit together. Yeah. They all work together, you know? And I think, I think that that was something that I don't know if she was particularly and David were particularly looking for that, but that's certainly when I was there, that's what, we got that's what we had our style was different from from, from you know tom and max's style it was different from andy's style you know yep. whatever it was it was different but it was still right for dave Meryl fascinates me, uh, Steve. He, she, she just uh, because she is in in my you know, and not just my God. I mean, who am I? Uh, she is the mother of late night. You yeah. know, and, and when you think about that, uh, and not just the show late night, I'm talking the genre, I'm talking, you know, she brought the sensibility of, 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 of a mother in, in so many respects. You can say that, uh, on, on, yeah, I don't, many I don't more see levels. that, but I, I don't see that, but I'll take your, I mean, in the sense that, 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 I mean, I think Meryl is a genius, but the last thing I would accuse her of being is maternal. And I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think the show reflects that. I think what it does reflect is a really specific and really original style of comedy that she has that was hers and that, that meshed so, so well with David's at the beginning. But, but, but Meryl continues to write great material on her own that has nothing to do with David because that, that style was her. And I think that they meshed perfectly. And that, that, the show to me was always this great combination of David and Meryl and then ultimately us after, you know, down the line. But the, the, those two are the, are the keystones of what made the show what it was the alchemy and of the two the alchemy um, their, their alchemy together was, was specifically what the show was and the rest of us you know fit in where we could so i was going to go down the path of, of of the fact that you know the mother the protective role how she protected right. the rest of the staff from the network well, she did do that. Like that she did do that yes that's you know, true i would absolutely give her credit for that but her uh, fingerprints she, like and and maybe it is maybe make... it's just that alchemy i think about dog poetry and and, and some of these things that just to me, a man doesn't come up with some of the stuff and, and from the angle that she did, mm -hmm. but but then take when you look at her background, yeah, she wasn't raised uh and bred to be this maverick uh no. leader. She was an art, she was she was an artist, yep. you know, her yep. background was an artist. So so part of it wasn't just the genius and the intelligence that she brought to the table, but it was also the fresh perspective coming from right. out of nowhere. Right. Um, and, and, and looking at this, um, you know, she'd never run a show before. And then, and then, you know, on the, on, on the morning, she famously, the morning. yeah, famously yeah. it's like, okay, well, it's, here it's you go. Take the under, reins. Right. You know, no one's, exactly. don't, no one's driving the stagecoach. Here you go. Right. Right. You know, and, and, and that part of it as well, um, bring that fresh perspective in is a, is, is a huge part of it as well. I, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I have nothing, but I love when you guys, when the old school guys come on here and sing Meryl's praises. We haven't had her on the show yet. I want to very, very, very badly. Um, obviously, uh, the, the the level of respect I have for her is through the roof. And 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 what I love, and that's me as a viewer, me as a as a, as a guy who really appreciates this. But what I even appreciate more, and this kind of goes back to the Cronkite thing, is how much the war horses like you. Uh, you know, and, and, and everyone else who worked for her, the, the, the level of respect that they have for her is uh, it's, it's, it's gigantic. Mm -hmm. It's so, yeah, good no, the, that. The, it would not have been the same show. I mean, it would not even close, um, which is not, not at all taking anything away from David at all. No, but I mean, you know, it, it was a case of taking David's sensibility and finding a way to make that work as a television show. Yes. And, you know, that was the, where they combined so well. That uh, they both they both knew what they wanted to do, and they own each had their own individual way of of achieving it, 
and that it just it just worked. You know, I mean, uh, you know, nobody really wrote better for Dave than Merrill did. And uh, and by the same token, things that you know that I see Dave things that make me think of Merrill back going the other way direction. That I mean, they just affect. It was just that that connection. Um, you know, it it and it, it was able to. You know, I, I'm not taking away the other people who worked on the show. You know, Merrill was only there as head writer for a short time, really, by the comparison with everything else. Yeah. And the show changed from the other people who worked there. It changed when Steve O'Donnell was there yep. as head writer. It changed, you know, all along the way. Yeah. Um, but without that first grounding, you know, who yeah. knows? I, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, it's very cool that you have that perspective. It's just very, so very few of us do because Dave is kind of the, you know, what we see with Dave is he's the Frankenstein of all of these other writers. You know, I've, I've talked yeah, to so many see, writers. There's Go a ahead. danger there too. And I want to stop you because please. And I find myself doing this sometimes too, when I'm raving about Merrill, which is in a sense almost to make Dave sound like a puppet of some sort uh, or like, you know, and that is absolutely not the case. Yes. I mean, every word that came out of Dave's mouth was something Dave either wanted with something supplied that he, he, that was that he liked or his own. Yes. And by the way, one of the connections between he, between David and Steve Allen is that they were the two greatest improvisers I ever saw in my life. Yeah. And I never saw anybody. And, and there was a frustration sometimes on the show, the minor frustration, but we could never write jokes as funny as David could come up with ad libbing in the on moment. the fly. Yes. On the fly. Yep. And we just sit like you sit back and say, you know, wow. And that was that was continuous. That was always there. Uh, so he didn't, you know, it, it felt it's fun to write for him because he wrote great, you know, it was because of that. But then you would sit the, the things we, I loved best watching the show were just the things where Dave was winging it when he was just out, you know, we, when he was talking to members of the audience or talking to this or, you know, whatever happened. And that's another thing Dave loved when things went wrong in the show, because then he could, it would give him more leeway to ad lib. Without a doubt. I mean, and, and I, I, yeah. he, he was so brilliant at that. Still is, you know, I mean, he's just, he's just that fast. He, he had that kind of brain that could, work that way. So I think the com the composite is Merrill as a writer and Dave as a writer thinker at the same, yes. you know, um, sometimes they, people would say, you know, because Dave always had a writing credit on the show. I said, well, was that justified? Well, yeah, because even if he did, and he did write occasional bits for the show, but he didn't do it that often. But if it, if 40 to 50 percent of the laughs on a given show were came came out of Dave's mouth ad living, that's writing. Ad living is writing. Absolutely. Oh, of course it is. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if you were, if you would, I know you, you would come and kind of, kind of come in and out and you're aware of a lot of these things that happened after mm -hmm. the fact, but I think about when Rod Blagojevich came on and, uh, you know, he comes on and sits down and this is before, you know, this is just as things are, he's right in the headlines, you know, and, and he comes and sits down and he looks at Dave and goes, Oh boy, I've been, I've wanted to be on this show in the worst way. And Dave, without even missing a beat, well, you're sure you're sure as hell here on the, in the, you know, in yeah. the worst way. He said it like so fast yeah. and it was yeah, just, yeah, yeah. that's yes, absolutely. That writing on the fly, like that's Dave's, the, that's his calling card is, is these ad libs. And, and I think, um, I don't know if it was your, one of the most you, fun, might, go ahead. I said one of the most fun moments for me on the show, because it didn't happen often, but, but once Merrill came and asked everybody, cause they, they were doing a, a thing with Ron Popeil. You probably don't remember who he wa was. He was a guy who did this, sell this crap that they would sell in the middle of the night, you know, really cheesy products that they would sell. Uh, commercials and, and he invented an earlier incarnation stuff. of the sham wow guy yeah but he did a, like a whole bunch of products and yeah. there were like dozens of them and so he was on the show and he was going to present some of those show some of those things and Merrill said if you have any ideas for ad libs for for this you know you know can you toss them in and i i we, we all we actually he he picked one from me and one from carl's he didn't get to use carl's he actually apologized to carl later for not not getting to it because it was a great line the one that i wrote he had a thing called Mr. Dentist that he was selling, which was a box with tools, you know, that you could perform dentistry on yourself. And the line <laughs> I gave today was, I understand you had a bit of legal trouble with your Mr. Brain Surgeon. And, um, and Dave said it as if, and it sounded like he was making it up. He actually was reaching for another one of these products when he said it. So it sounded uh -huh. like as I wrote a day bad lib. That's, you know, that, that's about as good as it can get. Uh, that's, but that's the fantastic. only time. That's the only time that ever happened that I could recall. Hey, um, yeah, but that's a good one. And and the fact that you get one, you know, that's yeah, I got uh, one. I got one. Yeah. Uh, and it sounded like him, which is make which is the ideal. I mean, it sounded like he made it up, which is which is what you really want it to be. 
in that context. You know, whenever you're writing for any given comedian, you really want it to sound like his yeah. voice. And and that's the, the first thing you learn is to adjust. And I remember our first couple of days working with Robert Klein. And, you know, I, I knew Robert Klein. I saw his first Carson appearance. I was a fan of his for a decade before I worked for him, more yeah. than a decade. And yet we were doing remote pieces. The first thing we did for with Robert was remote pieces for NBC bloopers and practical jokes show. It was Robert on the streets of New York. And without even being aware of it, we started writing lines that were a little Davish. And Robert said, and he, he sort of caught us immediately. He said, you know, that's that's a Dave line. And and the, the and we never it never happened again. You know, then we started adjusting our, our material. Then I, it was I'm really gonna put you on the spot. You don't you don't remember the the context or you don't no. remember the joke, do you? No, okay. Not at all. That's not at all. That's I think, fantastic, I think it was probably though. I think it was probably an insult. I think okay. it was like an insult. And you know, Robert doesn't do those. He doesn't do insults. Yep. And uh, you know, I should have been the first one to realize that they haven't been a fan of this for that long. But it did, you know, to our credit, we shifted fast and then we did never had that note from Robert again. Did, uh, um, did I mean, and I don't want to tell tales out of school with mm -hmm. this or, or anything like that, but uh, did, did Robert have a, uh, does Robert have a regard for Dave? Is there a, is there a thing there? I, think I would does. imagine the mutual respect I know is, Robert, is formidable. I, Dave did, I know Dave did for Robert. Yeah. And oh, I yeah. Think, I, you know, yeah. And, absolutely. And yeah, I think, I think that, that Robert did, I think, you know, Robert's context, he, he doesn't really talk about comedians of his, of that, his own time very much right. person. He loved the same people that I loved, which is the older comedians. You know, he loved, you know, he loved his, he adores Phil Silvers. The Bilko Show is one of his favorites. He loves the Marx Brothers and Buster Keaton and Laurel and Hardy. And you go to his house, he's got posters of these, you know, original posters, Marx Brothers yeah. posters, of that stuff. And so we connected very quickly on that score. And, you know, the, 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 uh, I think it was his, the first birthday that I was working with him. I got, we, I, we got him a, a copy of the new, uh, at that time it was a new book on Stan Laurel. And it's, and I, it's still on the shelf when I visit his house. I can still, I can still find it on the shelf. Um, and uh, so, so we connected very quickly that way. And then that he adores those people. And you see a lot of that too. Like every now and then you hear Robert do a WC Fields take reaction or he'll do a bit of Phil Silvers. He, he used to call when we were working for him, he would go, why not? Tita, but hey, you know, he was doing this good <laughs> Bilko. So, uh, so I started calling him Sarge when we were working for him so just to <laughs> keep it going. Um, so that was, I, but I think, I think he respected Dave. He respects Dave very much. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I love, I love this legacy of, of influencers versus influencees. Mm -hmm. And I mean, influencer has taken a completely different turn when you look at that term now, but, um, you know, well, Robert I'm, Klein to Jerry Seinfeld. And, yeah. And, and, I, and it makes me crazy now that they're, and I, I, hate, I hate that it's happening, but there are too many people I'm running into who don't know who he is. Yeah. And, you know, if you know who Seinfeld is and you don't know who Robert Klein is, Jerry Seinfeld would be the first person to say you ought to know who Robert Klein is because he cites Robert as one of his, if not his definitive influence. Robert was one of the first great comedians to stand ups to do um, what we call now call observational humor. It's, it wasn't one, it wasn't one line gags with my mother. So my mother in law is so whatever. It was material about life, about daily life, about things that you saw, things that you did. And he was so, it was and still is, you know, if you see him perform now, he's still the best at that. Uh, and, and he's just such a great mark for the, I mean, I remember hearing, I think I told you a story, but I think it was off camera, uh, yeah. that I saw a show that when Jay Leno had Billy Crystal on, and on, his, on Jay's show, and they were both talking about, you know, how much influence Robert Klein was. And, 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 Chris, and I think it was Jay said, yeah, in my, room in my you know when i when i was getting started i had a giant poster of the child of the 50s record cover was on my wall that was the guy i had on my wall yeah. and you know you just see robert was so big and um I, I really wish people would reinvestigate i mean you can get a box set of his hbo special he was the first comedian to do an hbo special the very yep. first yep. uh and there is a box set uh, of dvds of his hbo specials all of them and I highly recommend them to anybody who cares about comedy at all. There's not a ton of Robert stuff on, on YouTube uh, because I think Robert's protected it very carefully. Yeah. But go buy it. I mean, the records, his records are available on CD or you could you know, be able to download them. They're probably yep. on, on uh, Spotify or yep. um, listen to the records, buy them, see the DVDs. And they're just as funny now as they ever were because, you know, he's talking about the daily things, you know, daily things of life. I... You quoted him the other day because I mean I, I was I 
I had a very entertaining weekend. I, I tripped going to the theater coming out of a, of a train station. And I'm going to ask to see the finger. Absolutely. I dislocated, yes, well, it's this finger, which, as you know, is very... <laughs> I told the doctor, I said, you know, this is very important in New York City discourse. You can't live without this figure. You have to fix this. Um, so, but, I, you know, they, they you know, you they almost fit dig me there, Steve. Thank you. It's, it's good for Danny Thomas. Danny Thomas, another one no one knows. It's good for us, too. Uh, they, but I was in there and they were trying to decide what painkillers. And they said, you know, said, what was your pain level? And I said, well, you know, it's like up here. Says, so I guess we were going to do just do. He listened to a couple of said, but how I think morphine's good. And I said, you know, I went like that. I said, and I said, Robert Klein's line, which was from which is, and I always identify it. Um, he has a bit about being bitten by a squirrel and having to go to the hospital. Okay. And and in the bit, he talks about getting morphine for the pain. And he's, he says, uh, the thing about morphine is you still feel the pain, you just don't give a damn. Uh <laughs> so I quoted that to these people, and, and you know, they 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 laughed and you know, it's still funny. You said it in his voice, and I could hear it in his voice, which is... I, I sort of did. I, I, I modified his voice a little bit, because since I didn't think they knew who he was, I didn't think doing an impression of him was going to help. Uh, <laughs> but I helped a lot. But I did I did credit him as as a great comedian that I know. So, you and I, I use his just shout out to the to our first episode with uh, with Steve. Go back and watch it uh, because he talks about uh, another story where he actually uh, did Robert in front of him in his voice. And and anyway, that's in our first yeah. episode with Steve. So you can go back and listen to that. Um, Oh, speaking of which, I uh, I have a couple little uh, cleanup items that I, I have to do from people who uh, ask questions from the first episode. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one's a very simple one, um, and then the second one is like uh, the second one's probably simple, but we could go we could go deep with it if we wanted to, uh, because he's in the news. But the first one's very simple. The thumbnail picture. Oh, by the way, I want to show you before we finish here. I want to show you uh, uh, the, the the picture. Uh, I got to ask permission to use for the thumbnail for 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 this episode. I, I'm going to show it in the camera here make sure that you're okay with it but the first uh episode the picture <laughs> of you was you and dick van dyke and yeah. uh and we didn't talk about him at all in yeah. the episode and more than like a handful of people he said hey you got this picture of steve and dick and you didn't even talk about him so let's uh let's let's so talk more, about that more than a handful and... is usually my is my basic fan group you know it's like it, it, less less than a, a, a soiree more than a handful you know it's, it's somewhere in there um yeah it was like this was when i was growing up i guess i did say last i think last time i loved all comedians the older comedians the contemporary comedians everybody yeah. I, I just loved everybody and i i remember my father and i watching our first dick van dyke show episode together it was i remember the episode the second season episode uh about the the time it's a flashback about rob not being able to get wet married it kept things kept going wrong and yeah. it's a fantastic episode and, and it reminded me, even as a kid, of kind of a Laurel and Hardy kind of episode, very physical. And I fell in love with Van Dyke immediately. You know, and I later found out, of course, he was, he adored and knew Stan Laurel, but, and knew all these guys, but he loved all that kind of comedy. But from that moment, he, I, you know, he was one of my absolute favorite people. And one of the things I always wanted to do in the business was, well, you know, I used to, I mean, obviously I was too, not going to be able to write for the Van Dyke show because I was too young. Yes, uh, I was, you know, I was 10 or whatever. Yeah. Um, but and but I, I said, you know, I want to I would love to write for this guy someday. And, you know, I, the first spec script I ever wrote when we were still I was still in college was for the new Dick Van Dyke show. That, that's the very first part that Carl and I wrote. That was our very first spec script. And um, and, you know, you get to a certain age and you realize certain dreams are not going to happen. You set them aside. Yes. Right. You, you know, you get to your mid 30s and, you know, you're not going to. You're not going to work with the Beatles. And you're not going to do it as whatever. Uh, and so I said, well, it, it was a nice dream, but I didn't expect it to happen. Yeah. And then you're preaching to the choir with that, by the way. Of what? Playing with the Beatles? No, just or just having a dream. Yeah. Never well, in a million, never in a million years did I expect it's to not be doing too late. this. Yeah. It's not yeah. too late for you because you're, you know, you're not much older than I was when this happened to me. I think. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> and it's all due to, to my then partner Hillary Rollins. I was writing with. And Hillary had worked at Nick at Night, and uh, before she came to the Disney show, I was and gonna, okay, they, yeah, holy, and and they they called her and they said we, you know, they had been using Dick Van Dyke as a, as a, they called him the chair, the, the uh, Nick at Night's chairman, uh, and so, and they were doing he did commercials for them, and yeah. they they wanted to do an evening where he would be introducing his five favorite episodes of the show, 
And they asked Hillary to write it. And Hillary called me one day and said, listen, I've got this offer from, from Nick at Night. And uh, I, I don't know if you, I'd like you to work with me if you want to. It's, it's commercials. They said, well, I don't, I don't know uh, commercials. I don't know at this point in our careers, is something we should be doing. He said, they're with Dick Van Dyke. And I said, what time do you want me there? <laughs> yep. And it turned out more to be more of a show than it was originally supposed to be just commercial spots, but it, but it essentially became a show. Yeah. And, you know, we were gotten this, this dream job of writing comedy for Dick Van Dyke. And, uh, you know, I still, I have such a vivid memory of all of these things connected with the show. I remember, you know, we were gathering from a group meeting in in uh, in the offices of Nick and Mike in the, with the executives and everybody else. Yeah. And they got Dick Van Dyke on the phone. And, and you know, they had the speakerphone on and they said. And, the, and, uh, and you're a jaded home. comedy writer by this time. Like you've no, gone no, through I, yeah, life. No. I was. Yeah, I was 10 again. And uh, literally, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, they, they said. And these are the writers. Uh, this is Steve and Laurie. And, and Dick's that voice, which he has, is so distinctive. And he says, hi, Steve. Hi, Laurie. And I literally turned to, to, to Hillary and went like this. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Like that. It was, it was so stunning um, to me. But we we tried to write. You know, we actually did. We got a couple of people who had worked on the show before to go on the thing. We we supposed to have Carl Reiner. Unfortunately, his his, his wife took ill around that time. And we, he had to drop out. But we got Larry Matthews, who played Richie on the show. We got uh frank adamo who had been his dresser but he used to work and do spots with him he was always on that show if you recognize the tall lanky guy you'd know him in a second uh and a second dream this is a two-part dream because one of the episodes had kathleen, kathleen freeman in. now kathleen freeman is one of the great comic actresses of all time you know her from jerry lewis movies she was the yeah. the, the, the vocal coach coach and singing in the rain you know round oh tones, my gosh those. yeah she was, she was one of the greatest and she was in one of these so i I said, we've got to get her on the show, too. So we got to Kathleen Freeman on the show. That's a whole other story of, of fandom. But we got all these people. We put this thing together. And, you know, it was a dream come true. We came out to California. Uh, they, they, they did the Nick and Knight people were wonderful. And they, you know, they, they, they put us up and they brought us out to work on this thing. We were there. And I just I followed him around like a puppy dog for, for all the time we we're doing this thing. He was so nice and so generous with his time and so easy to, you know, uh, you know, he could have easily. And I said to him at one point, listen, if I get on your nerves, please, I don't want to be that person. Just send me away. <laughs> he couldn't have been nicer. Uh, and, you know, I said, I don't I said there was this, the, the, this, the picture that you saw that you used came from a few years before that on the Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, when they opened up the the, uh, the Disney MGM Studios, they were getting footprints, famous footprints for their their grandma's Chinese. That they had. And Dick Van Dyke was one of them. Yep. So all the writers, all the writers on the on the Mouse Club were fans. So we ran out to see if, you know, to see this happen. Then we asked as a group if we could take a picture with him. So we all gather around Dick Van Dyke. And um, we're, 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 we're standing and it's taking a while to set up the camera. You know, right. it's starting to feel uncomfortable because you don't want to make him stand there for so long. Yep. And I actually looked at him and he happened to, to turn and look at me at that moment. I couldn't think of anything else to do. So I went like that and he did <laughs> he did like that back to me and i said well i've stand with dick van dyke i can retire from show business yep so the the first day that i was working when we first introduced him i told him that story and he said you know i said well you know the first time i met stan laurel so i know how it's, it's really sweet for you to say that about how much you know and he said the first day i met stan laurel i came up you know and by the time he was very famous dick was very famous mm -hmm. and he was invited to Stan's, he had a little apartment in Venice, California. And he, he, he got out of the elevator and there was, there was a hallway, he turned, he saw this hallway and the, and the door opened and Stan went down, leaned down and says, hi there, Dickie. And, and Dick said, I could have retired then too. So, you know, it, it, so that's awesome. I don't know that we connected on that, but he, again, he couldn't have been so nice. And, and the only said, I, I asked nothing with you for the rest of the things that before we leave, I would love to have a, a two Stan's picture with you. You know, says so if we can do a two stands picture, and and we got it. And of course, his his stand was much better than mine in the picture. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that's only fair. Uh, so so that's what that picture was about. But it was such I, and, a joy. And we're calling back, by the way, uh, earlier in the episode when we talked about the idea of these people that you look up to, and then when you meet mm -hmm. them, same deal. You've been very blessed mm -hmm. that you have a couple of those experiences where a it lot turned of, out to be better was, than you even imagined. Kathleen Freeman was just as, as great to, to be with, uh, wonderful. 
just a, a pleasure. She would, during lunch, instead of going off, you know, whenever she would come and sit with all of us and just t tell stories, you know, everybody could ask her questions. We just all tell her stories. She would tell, I mean, she would tell her stories. It was fantastic. And yeah, I've been very, very lucky. Part of it, I think I'm pretty lucky in that I think I have a pretty good sense of who you would want to meet. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. You, you oh, wanna... there you go. Yeah. Because there's sometimes, you know, some people that I have great admiration for, I just have a feeling, yeah, let it pass. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and frankly, Jerry, appreciate Lewis the art. Those... Don't take it any further than that. Well, there were a couple of Jerry Lewis fans on the Letterman show. We were, we were you know, Tom, Tom Gamble was a big Jerry Lewis fan. Yeah. And we, we but we talked about it beforehand. He said, you know, because he has a reputation, he can be difficult. I think that may be putting it mildly, but but yeah. we but we both figured this is one that we had to we had to make the roll the dice regardless. Yeah. Uh, normally, I think I would have passed, but I I can't, couldn't not because it was Jerry yeah. Lewis. And, you know, he, legend. You know, one of the first, yeah, legend. One of the first comedians who ever made me laugh hysterically. Am I, I going to see Mount Rushmore myself. or not? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, go see when it. I was like, I mean, I saw the, the, the bellboy came out when I was 19, what, 1960. So I would have been like six or seven. And, you know, and I, I you know, it could laugh forever. Yeah. So uh, maybe it was because he was, you know, he was comfortable because he was on a show where he knew everybody liked him. Dave is a big fan. Put Paul Schaefer is a big fan. He was surrounded yeah. by people. He couldn't have been nicer that day. He was just a, this, and and also I have to say what I liked about it is he he whenever we we I would ask him something about you know something about him and he would ask something about the, the show. Yeah, he asked me about Calvert, which came out to be perfect because I was the guy to tell him the story. So he could have been nicer. Other people I know who have since then, and I won't tell the stories, but who had really bad experiences with him. Yeah, after that. So I'm not making up Jerry Lewis to be a saint by any means. I'm no. just saying I got. In, in the case of meeting people you admire, I, I've been very lucky. You've had and good I have no bad, I have no bad experiences with anybody I met that I admire. Uh, no. you, you mentioned Calvert DeForest. I'm just gonna I'm gonna mm -hmm. say this. Larry Bud Melman. I met Calvert. Uh, He's very nice. You know, I heard he was could be evil backstage, but he, Calvert couldn't have been nicer with when he met us. You know, well, I mean, it, you know. I mean, your perspective is a little different though, because at the end of the day, you're you're the one that, that was kinda... a joke. That oh, was a joke. oh 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 oh! <laughs> you know what? You know where I, you know where I went with that because we I had have Rogalski no idea, but on. You're currently, weren't around here. What? We had Rogalski on not too long ago, and he uh -huh. was uh, one of the guys in charge of, uh, like, he and Calvert went on the, 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 the transatlantic adventure, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. He was he was traveling with him for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? And and so A dream come true for anybody. Well, oh man, uh, uh, fantastic! That was also a joke. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. We're um, losing but, ground here, aren't we, Mike? Uh, something's happening. I don't know. I've lost but, the thread, apparently. Oh, so, no, 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 you, you certainly didn't. Um, but if I, I had mean, done you know, a day's voice was a dream come true, wasn't it? You know, then, then would you have gotten it if it was meant to be sarcasm? But go ahead. It was, remember, for... remember the, the Santa Claus thing? It was, it was magic, wasn't it? That was, oh. that was Dave's line. <laughs> but it was just it not was magic. the magic that he was. No, yeah, which not is, at all. That's right. Uh, by the way, this is the, uh, if, if it's okay with you, I would like to use this as the thumbnail for this episode, if you're okay with this. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. It's oh, going blurry. There you go. No, what is it a picture of? Tell me, just tell me, because I can't. Oh, it's the, 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 the sponge and, but I can't tell what the picture is on top of that. Can you tell me? I can't Absolutely. see it. Absolutely. Uh, it's Calvert uh, on stage here. I'll do this here. Yeah, just, it, oh, okay uh yeah you can show that i mean i wasn't there i, mean, I think that was going to the night of a thousand stars or something well i, I took that picture was... in your apartment no no but i mean the picture of calvert i don't know where the picture oh, of calvert is. yeah 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 i just I mean, I uh, i just I... thought the original yeah, no, no, sponge okay. your uh your name tag and the original sponge i thought that would be a good thumbnail the original for this episode. Sponge, yes how much is that worth now Up, upwards of eleven dollars i think you know, it's funny. Uh, there's there are some folks where if you gathered them all in one room mm -hmm. and you put on a, a, a like a you know a spontaneous auction for that sponge, I bet you it would go huge if it's the right people were in that room. Dave, no, I, I was being sarcastic his... then too. So we'll just keep rolling along here as we are. Well, Dave, what if Dave put up one of his worldwide pants jackets uh, uh -huh. just just now, and they I believe they suspended the auction because the bid went over eight thousand dollars, and they're like, okay, well, hold on a second here, like like there's some people who are crazy for this stuff. Wait a minute. All right. Ah, he's going to go get it right on. <laughs> How much is this? Wait, can I get on camera? How much is one of these worth to you, buddy? Man, that's, that's original. <sighs> that they, that's... they stopped making. They stopped making those. This is the, these are the ones that didn't have Dave's name on it, because in those days, he felt uncomfortable having his name on these things. 
So this this is a first generation jacket boy. Shout so, out to Mark Carson, by the way, um, who 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 uh, basically conceived the idea of the jack for one of the bumpers. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where the that's where the original jacket came from. But yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the OG ones. Oh, you got a fun story about one of those jackets, Carl's version of 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 that jacket. Oh yeah, I I no hundred. All right, I'm gonna tell this, but because you asked for it, but it, <laughs> Carl didn't have, you know was, was tended to be. And not quite, he had right, right reason to be. He didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I was, you know, even even on this working on the show, whatever, he would tend to be careful with money. And and so well, especially at that point, you guys are all yeah, kids. at that point it's, we didn't it's, know. It's, it's an yeah, upstart knew? show based who on knew? a show that got I mean, canceled. I, I like, know, I, of course. I, I know my father said when he heard what because he used to work in television, he said he, when he heard what kind of salary we were making, he said, My God, I can't believe they get that much for that money for doing this. Um <laughs> respect. And now that probably would seem like very little money, I hate to say, after all these years. But but in any case, so you you never knew. And so yeah. they went around and they were asking people to, you know, about the, they were, order, were expecting to pay for our jackets. We all were yep. going to buy our jackets, uh, which was required at Disney later on because uh, <laughs> they paid for nothing. Uh, but in any case, we, we, you know, we, and they said, do you want um, um, leather or vinyl sleeves? The vinyl sleeves are cheaper. The only person in the entire office who opted for the vinyl sleeves was Carl. And then Dave picked up the tab for all the jackets <laughs> without telling anybody. But he and got the that, only vinyl one. Yeah, because he now now he has a limited edition. So you can look exactly. at that. It may be more it may be more valuable now because he has a vinyl sleeves. Though for all I know, he sold it already by now. Entirely that possible. that's that's exactly the reason I wanted to get this out there. It's the only one, and it's the only vinyl sleeve jacket. So the, the, the unlikely possibility that Carl's listening to this, <laughs> take care of that jacket because it's worth <laughs> money. Um, I had a couple other questions, uh, uh, little pieces of business to clean up after the last episode. Uh, now first is, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to provide a little bit of insight and I did in the intro as well. Uh, I'm going to ask you the question here. Is this the same wall of books that you're in front of now that you were in front of for our previous yeah. interview, or is this a different yeah. wall of books? No, it's the same wall of books. It's the same one. It, okay. I'm just, I'm used to this angle. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't off. have to be the same wall of books. You no, can, no, there are other walls. You have options. I have options. I have too many books. <laughs> I have too I have too many, too much of everything, except work. <laughs> well, I was emailing Lori. Uh, Lori and I were going back and forth, and 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 you know, was Steve, oh, Steve's at the library. It's like, oh, that's perfect. I loved I loved hearing that. That was uh... I you know, a few years ago. We you know on on the Seventy Ninth Street Library, I ran to Steve O'Donnell there. So okay, we you know is that uh, there you are. <laughs> I really wanted to be I at that breakfast, more. by the way. When I heard that, you, mm -hmm. that he came over for breakfast, I, I really, I, I had, a, I had, I had what the kids call FOMO. I, I had the fear of missing out. I, I really wanted to be at that breakfast uh, after, after we had breakfast, and then O'Donnell came over uh, to your guys' house. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can imagine but the conversation have, yeah. would have been fantastic. Don, Don Giller is very funny. I'm going to quote a Don Giller line now. Uh, he was talking about the fact that because he. In the picture that Steve took with you, his head, he usually he tilts his head yeah. in pictures. And it was straight up on on the picture with you. And, uh, and he said, uh, that, that's, not, that's not Steve O'Donnell because his head's <laughs> not tilted. And I, I, I wrote, I, uh, he did on Facebook and I wrote back, the spinal surgery was a complete success. So we're, we're, all, very, <laughs> we're all very happy. And what I talked about with Steve, and he said, I think I probably do that because I'm tall. And I'm just used to try to get, to get my head into pictures. But um, <laughs> I hadn't even noticed that until Don pointed that out that Steve told did it. Oh, head. you talk about observational and with a with a, a, a rapier like wit. Uh, Giller is just he's a killer. Giller the killer. Don's he's a very comedy funny killer. Yeah, it's very funny. It's really extremely funny. funny. Um, now let's stop talking about it because we want to get him a more swell head than he already is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't. Uh, want okay, Donna. the other thing. The other thing, and it'll tie this. I, I God, I hate to end this with you. I thank you so much that 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 we've become. Uh, friendly and and I'm so grateful we can do this uh, you know periodically and, and I really you know. enjoy this I mean anytime you know I, I think your audience have had enough by now but anytime you know M Lori pre prepared a whole list of topics we never talked about and we still have um, we didn't talk about Andy Kaufman I think oh we did talk oh. about that uh, we didn't talk about um, Bill Murray the Bill Murray thing we're, okay that. there's where we're about to go I'm about to okay. go to Bill Murray yeah um, and the reason I want to go to Bill Murray is because I was uh, uh, 
you know, for the most part, I'm not criticized too, too much. And I've got a few people in my life who uh, give me brutal honesty about the show because the brutal honesty mm -hmm. is what helps improve it. But there were a, folk, a few folks who kindly observed that uh, you were one of the OG late night with David Letterman writers. The first episode legendary mm -hmm. in, in in some respects those who are in the know understand <clears throat> that the you know the, bill murray being the first guest insane amount of prep for the first episode as opposed to all the rest of the episodes because right. the rest of the episodes it's break night speed you're literally kind of going as it's rolling whether you whether whether you're injured or not it's rolling uh but the first episode there was a lot of prep and, and uh the well, writers, there's supposed to be a lot of prep i don't know well, how it showed up on the air um, <laughs> the writers all went to Bill Murray's house, and uh, no, and the, the didn't stories they got drunk. Bill, came to, Bill Murray did that. No one knows where Bill Murray's house is, uh, ex <laughs> except that except that that he that, no, I don't know. I have no idea. No, he came to he came to thirty to thirty Rock because you know okay. I mean that was stomping ground. But but Bill, okay. So this story, I mean, there, there's versions of the story have been told in some of the books and things like that. Yes, but I would I would point out that that uh, that I probably know more details for it. I'll tell you you'll know why in a, in a few moments. Okay. Yeah. So this is about a, I guess this was about a week before I I kept in my stories. I, I always tell stories incorrectly, and then Don Geller explains to me why I can't possibly be right. Yes. And then he corrects me about my own memories. Um. <laughs> I, but it was I guess about probably about a week before the show, um, to try to come up with something to do, on on this first show for him to do. Yeah. And so, you know, he has. SNL hours, I guess. So we met after the show, not after the show, but we had not show yet, but after five, after everybody else yeah. left. <clears throat> we go into the conference room and Bill Murray starts prepping the room. And first thing he does, he has one of the old boom boxes, which were, I guess, more pop, more typical then. Sure. He he puts Fair it on, he puts, finds a station he wants, doesn't like the sound quality. So he takes one of the metal garbage cans, turns it over, takes all the garbage out of it, puts it inside the can, puts it on the table with the, so the resonance will be to the way he liked it. So he, he put that there. Uh, uh, he, at one, some point he gets with the, one of the surviving interns, wherever's still there. It says, and orders tequila for the room, sends him out for tequila. Um, now, now he's, he's got the music going, the tequila's coming in and he doesn't like the lighting. So he, he, he puts the lamp where he wants it. He takes his, his, I think, I don't know, his jacket, I think it was a sweater. He had, he takes a sweater and he, Kind of drapes it around the top, the the top of the lamp, so the lighting will be right, correct. A and, fire hazard, but it looks good. Well, you know what the <laughs> hell, right? And and you know here comes the tequila, so the people, the mark for making margaritas with people. And I'm thinking literally because this is my first, like my first or second week in show business. Yes. Period. Okay, I literally have come off of not being able to get seen by anybody to working yep. on an NBC television show. Yep. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be one of those parties that those SNL people have. You know, one of those parties, you know, I thought that was good. I don't know, right? Because we always heard stories. Yep. Um, but the, the thing that people don't say about when they tell that story that I've seen elsewhere is that that the moment he had everything to his liking, he sits, sits down and starts trying to write the show. We start trying to write bits. He was absolutely focused on trying to come up with something funny. We didn't get anything funny because, every you know, because... The writers were drink, drinking margaritas. What, <laughs> what, what was going to come out of that? <laughs> so absolutely nothing happened. But I remember it very well because I've never been a drinker and Carl's never been a drinker. So we were, I think, we're the only two sober people in the room. So I have a better memory that day than I suspect most of the other guys do. <laughs> so ultimately, he went off and came up with whatever he would, the thing, you know, the, the, let's, the uh, Olivia Newton John song, Let's Be Physical. He started dancing around. He grabbed our, our, uh, our, one of our, our, our uh, stage managers and started twirling her around without uh, letting her know he was going to do that. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's what he did. And everybody remembers that bit. That's, I, it's very, I think it's more strange than funny, but that's, that's Bill Murray and it would work. It was, you know, it worked for the show because it was something you wouldn't see everywhere. So that's yep. on the first show you saw that. Um, yep. But that, that was the, that was the story. And I, you know, I, I don't have any other, He's, you know, I don't have, didn't really get to know him. Laurie has something she wants to say. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the day, the day after the thing, I told, I, I run into Meryl first thing in the morning. She had hit left, she and David left long before this was going on. I said, do you know what, do you know what happened here last night? And she said, <laughs> yes. And he says, when will Bill learn, learn he can't get good comedy by getting the writer's drunk? Uh, so, 
I mean, she's doing that. That was in a maternal voice. That was being funny, but she was doing yeah. it as a fake mother kind of joke. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we didn't get anything funny out of it, but it's a story. And other than that, you know, he'd be on the show and I'd say hi. And he, he did, I think he tended to remember our, our names. So again, but I don't know much beyond that. I, I know that, uh, you know, another Bill Murray story I know secondhand, which is that um, Robert Klein's house is on the top of a hill uh, where there's a golf course at the bottom. Yeah, and there's a porch. Robert has a porch, which one? When you know that is out there, side there, and apparently somebody told Bill Murray what was was playing golf, and somebody said to him, "Do you know Robert Klein lives up the hill?" And <laughs> and and Bill Murray turns the golf cart around, drives up the hill, drives up the stairs, and onto Robert's porch to get him to get him out. Um, I don't know how much Robert to this day. I don't know how much Robert really enjoyed that experience, but <laughs> but that's because yeah, legends love it when enthusiasts show up at their house, uh, even if they're Bill Murray. Like I mean, you know that. The... Well, yeah, I don't know, but I don't know <laughs> if they like you driving onto their porch. I know, right? You know, that's the question, right? I mean, it's an interesting thing. There's an interesting thing going on now, and again, I don't know him, so I don't know if stories are true or what stories aren't, or whatever. But there's an interesting thing going on where he's starting to get people started to complain about some of the things he did when he was working on movies, the way he treated women or something like that. Yeah. And you can look at that in a way as an interesting sort of extension of the fact that there, he has had this sort of Bill Murray leeway for 40 years, 40 years now, yeah. uh, based on uh, uh, the, what people know that that's, that's Bill Murray with in quotation yeah. marks. So he's famous for crashing people's weddings. He does this, he does that. And, it's an interesting turn now that people are starting to say, you know, maybe some of those things you did as Bill Murray that aren't weren't right. Weren't good. And it's not my judgment, it's their judgment. It's every people, individual's judgment. Yes. So I certainly accept, you know, the women who are saying that if he did this, but you know, it might in a sense it may have been hard for him to differentiate because he has this comedian's leeway that people weren't like that, that he would do crazy things because he was Bill Murray. So this is an interesting turn, I think, in terms of the stuff we were talking about before, <clears throat> of uh, of you know what what works now and did that that what doesn't work now that might have worked then. Uh, I, I, I don't know what you know. It's an interesting experience. I, I don't know how it's going to shake out ultimately for him as a as a performer as you know going forward. Um, I'll tell you how I want it to shake out, and I and mm -hmm. I think I do have a little bit of insight to this. Like I said, because of the the, the men's mental health uh, podcast that I host, and we mm -hmm. have talked a lot about this. Um, because there's a lot of people, not just men, but, but, but men in, in general is the focal point of the other show. So, so, you know, I'm skewed a little bit, but there's a lot of people who, um, are afraid because of previous behaviors that were mm -hmm. acceptable then, or even right. if they weren't acceptable, then it was, uh, viewed again from a different lens back then mm -hmm. versus now. And, and the one that I have a, I personally, as I see the pendulum have swung too far, my, this is again, just Mike's uh spitballing but the idea that and I'll, I'll bring up another example there's mr murray you talk about him right now i bring up senator al franken okay mm -hmm. uh, i think if a picture surfaces when he was a comedian and i think we all know the picture that we're talking about with mm -hmm. him on the on the on mm -hmm. the uh, military plane and the sleeping um you know a uh, soldier um you know there should be an opportunity if a picture like that surfaces it's as simple as oh i'm sorry you know what back then I was mm -hmm. jackass, whatever, whatever the thing is, right. there should be the opportunity to make right. amends. And I think that's the, the, the pendulum has swung yeah. too far. If it just swings back a notch or two, something from well, my I high mean, school, I mean, I don't know. I never did blackface or anything like that growing up, but if something showed up uh, of me in high school, I would love the opportunity to apologize I'm for sorry, it. And then Gillis, Don Gillis sent me a picture of you in blackface. So you, you <laughs> if anybody would have it, it'd be him. He I mean, has my it. gosh. And he sent it. So uh, just, just so you know. <laughs> So when it comes out tomorrow in the press, we can't say you weren't warned. Okay, oh, that's right. That's right. I, okay. But see, I never did it. But like right. our prime minister in Canada, Justin Trudeau, famously has this picture that went out right. of him in high school or elementary school. I didn't do it, but mm -hmm. I certainly was a part of uh, you know costume parties and things like that where people did it um, all sorts of ways back then. It was it was fine. And now I pity the people who 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 have this these you know skeletons in their closet. You know and 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 well, but, it's you know every every yeah things changed. I, I think part of Franklin's problem was he's he was a little not great at the at the if he simply just come out right and said yeah I was an idiot and this is what I did but it, he didn't quite do that at the time. So that had something to do with it. 
I mean, I think, frankly, I, th I think he should probably go. This would be a good time for him to run for Senate again. I think he'd get, he'd get back in, uh, frankly. And I think that's fine. The time has passed. And, you know, he's done his penance. Come on back and do that. You know, there, there are many people who probably suggest the, the best, best thing about him being in the Senate is to kept him out of comedy for a few years. But I'm not one of those people. I would never say that, of course. Uh, <laughs> hey, um, did you know, did you uh, cross paths with Al along the, no, you didn't. No, right? the closest I came to it was, for, uh, when he and, and uh, when he was Franken and Davis, they were on the Letterman show. Yeah, yeah. And I had, a, I, Carl and I had written a bit uh, for that was on, supposed to be on that show that they were going to be in. And then with, with Merrill's help, they genially, re, genially rewrote it without, you know, uh, to their, to their liking. And, you know, it's fine. It was, yeah. it, was it wasn't the greatest bit in the world anyway, but it was kind of a fun bit. Uh, and then, so they had lived their way through it, but I, I don't think I even met him on when they were on the, when they did that. So I have no, no, I have a very little connection to SNL people in general, except the ones I work with. <clears throat> I, uh, he's a guy that I think that you would probably get along with because you're both, uh, extremely intelligent. You both have that, uh, that perfect askew way of, of looking at things and observing things and then communicating, uh, mm -hmm. uh that, and, and I just appreciate, I appreciate your intelligence and your insights so much, Steve. Thank you. Um, you have this, and we didn't get to, you know, Steve Young, when he came on the show, he brought up the idea of the broken comedy writer and 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 the comedy writer's uh, mentality of 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 the way that they look at life and and you know you know they're 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 uh, sentenced to the idea when they find something hilarious to go oh that's funny you know <laughs> um, and not 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 belly laugh so much. Uh, I wanted to get into all of that kind of stuff with you. I mean, I've got I've got a list as well that we didn't get to, but we're we're at the point where uh, where I think it's time <laughs> to call it. Um, I love you, man. I love you. I love Lori. I'm so grateful that you guys are you in and candy both oh man this has been so much fun um any last here, words your cup. We sign oh. <laughs> your cup this is your cup right here that means the world um any final I words i'm afraid we, uh, to use it, it for anything because i'm afraid i'm going to break it so i actually don't use it as a cup because <laughs> i'm afraid it's gonna it's, it looks delicate to me i mean and i'm a klutz so you know you know what <laughs> oh lady wait I, <laughs> The whole cup with a maybe you could have it weaved. Sorry, it's an old Jerry line. Um, <clears throat> if, just speaking of Jerry Lewis, by the way, for for folks who 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 uh, the generation gap is really long. If you mm -hmm. want to see a very cool uh, a Jerry Lewis thing that you might be able to access, watch the comedians in cars getting coffee. Jerry Seinfeld with 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 Jerry. Uh, Lewis. That yeah, was he, a, what's that? It wasn't funny though. He, he, he no, was kind but, of sullen. No, it's more nostalgic and more of a yeah. more of a yeah. you know a, him talking to him, seeing him with his Oscar right. sitting there. Like right. it, it right. brings no, reverence yeah. to Jerry for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that you get. But you didn't and get then going through some of the clips and and talking about right. old show business and 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 you might see why when you realize how much Jerry, um, you know, he was four departments. Never mind, you know, four different roles, acting, directing, all that. He was yeah. four departments doing these movies that were making hey, I best picture see, Oscar not, you know. I lived to see a few years ago. They did it. They did Jerry Lewis at the Museum of Modern Art. They had a display of his storyboards and film clips. They had, you know, his, and I said, I'm so glad I lived long enough to see that. You know, yeah. uh, it probably helped that he had already passed by that time. So he couldn't get in the way and cause trouble. But it was <laughs> he, he was fully worthy of that. You know, whatever you think of him as human being. As an artist, I mean, he was a first-rate director. Ask Martin Scorsese, because you know he'll he'd be the first to tell you. Uh, yep. And he was very, and he invented the, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, the camera. The, what do you what do you call it? With the, I can't remember anything today. The, the camera that, so the video camera, vid, like the, the steady cam, or video the... assist, video assist. Oh, video. Oh, yeah, yeah. Video assist. He invented the video. He invented that. He, you know, the, uh, in fact, I, I, I always heard the story that he invented it. You know, the, 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 there was a video tape that he had. The, was the first thing he did was to actually because they didn't have videotape. He actually had monitors put in all the cor upper corners of the of the set because there was no videotape. So the video they would have had would to invent there, and he would how be we glancing, do that to make that happen. Was, he could glance at it during the shot, yeah, so he could see how it was working. Then he flew to to Japan to talk to the president of Sony to, to develop the the technology. So when they say he invented that, they're not kidding. He was at, he had his hands in telling the, the president of Sony what he needed and what would work for him. And there is not a there was now, of course, everybody shoots on video. But, in the, you know, for the for that, all those years of film, there is not a single director who did not use the video assist. And that's Jerry's. So. See, 
you think of Steven Spielberg, you think of George Lucas when it comes to, you know, creating uh, James Cameron mm-hmm. for creating technology for, um, you know, uh, to, to assist this kind of thing. You don't mm-hmm. necessarily think Jerry Lewis. I'm glad that you mentioned that today. Um, God damn. I love, I love doing this. I can't wait for our next okay. one. Uh, well, can't whenever, wait to see you guys in person. Um, as, as you know, I'm chronically unemployed, so I'm very, very available. So, <laughs> well, God, I, you know, and again, this is the, this is the dreamer. Uh, this is the dreamer in me, but, but the idea that I've talked to so many folks who, who, who worked for, uh, any w- number of, of Dave's productions that, that, that would love to have an outlet to do something. Um, and when I think of the idea of being able to create a platform or a place where people could do that, we talk about this idea of the Letterman podcast network and some of these other things that we're, we're dreaming and pitching and all of these things. You're one of the first guys I think of that. You talk about chronically unemployed and all that. Oh my God, Stephen, you are uh, a, a plethora of insight, um, wisdom, um, thank you, entertainment, and and, and, and I will and plug. I, I do want to plug one thing. I don't remember if I Please. did last. Time. I think I did. Then we can then we can wrap this up sure. because when I said unemployed, the the I I've been writing film essays for Criterion for a yes. while now, and the, the and they can get them at the website. They also Barnes and Noble still has their half price sale. The two I wrote the booklet essays for, Harold Lloyd's The Freshman, which is a masterpiece, and The In Laws, uh, Andrew Bergman and, and Arthur Hiller with with uh, with uh, uh, Peter Falk and Alan Arkin. It's absolutely hysterically funny. And those two are available for half price, like all the other Criterion discs for the next. I don't get any money when they sell them. So this is just me doing it because I love those guys. The yeah. people at Criterion are wonderful, wonderful people. So I wanted to, to plug them for, for what they did and giving me this sort of second weird career. Uh, I got rid of all of my DVDs except for the Criterion ones. Uh, I, I can't. I can't. But you know, do the, you have the, the love. freshman and the in-laws? Do you own a copy of those too? I don't. I don't. You, well, you have you have about four days left to get the Blu-rays with my, these are essays and fantastic extras, and they're both masterpieces, and they should be on your shelf. Both movies. Okay. Um, the next time, and, and I'm just going to throw this out to the to the ether as well. The next time uh, we're in New York, I want to um, I want to put you and I want to put Shecky in a room, and I just want to sit there and listen to you guys talk about old film. Um, I'm a big fan of the, the the passage of knowledge and the transfer of knowledge and all that, and you are that guy, and uh, I just appreciate the hell out of you, man. Um, Till the next Thank time, and, okay. and that's how we're going to say this. I hope the finger it, gets better. It was, um, it's, it's almost I can get it about halfway down now at this point, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do a quick. I'm outro. so glad I'm, uh, it was wasn't my right hand. Anyway, I love the can, love the candy. And we absolutely, will see I'll do a quick outro here, and then uh, I'll, okay. we can say our goodbye privately. So, uh, okay. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, this is a day off for me. Not that all the the, the podcasts that we do here are, are, aren't a day off for me; they're all lovely. But obviously, just talking with friends is 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 a phenomenal thing. Steve is just um, this amazing, amazing uh, resource of memory, of insight, all of these things. I love this so much. Please, if you uh, if if you like this show, hell, if you don't like this show, please like please share please subscribe all of that stuff um i'm getting sick and tired of saying it i can't wait to get to the point where i don't have to say it anymore uh but we're not there yet um please like share subscribe the letterman podcast uh please join the facebook group uh, and then of course uh the letterman podcast has one sponsor and that is uh, rupert g and the hello deli go to hello dash deli.com and uh check out the letterman merchandise the rupert merchandise and and let's just i'm just gonna throw this out there and please don't read into this as i say this you won't be able to do that forever you know um you know it's been a great run and hopefully that great run lasts longer for for rupert and may at the hello deli but at the end of the day um you know shop there sooner than later uh go see him if you're in the new york area go see him sooner than later again uh one of the most uh photographed people in the city of new york on a daily basis is rupert g um uh, my name is mike chisholm this has been the letterman podcast with mike chisholm i appreciate this so so much let's build something let's continue um and see what evolves from this uh for the letterman podcast thank you very much my name is mike chisholm thank you and good night overcoat and underpants